Hello, I'm Adam from Roots to Fruit. Whew, we've been working hard in the garden today and we've just stopped for our lunch. And I've got some vegetables here to eat today, some salad. They recommend that we eat at least five portions of fruit and vegetables every day, don't they? And I think that's probably good advice. But I've been thinking, I eat plants, but what if plants decided that they wanted to bite back? When we think of the word carnivore or carnivorous, it tends to conjure up images in our minds of lions and tigers and rampaging and roaring dinosaurs, perhaps. But there is another group of living organisms on this planet that lure, capture and digest their prey just as efficiently as those other creatures. And those organisms are carnivorous plants. There are many different species and varieties of carnivorous plant, but they all share some things in common. One of which is they tend to live in places where the soil is very low in nutrient. It's poor, impoverished soil. It's usually boggy and waterlogged. And it's for that reason that they have to capture their prey and digest it in the way that they do to get the nutrients that the soil doesn't provide them with. And though there are lots of different varieties and types of carnivorous plants, I'd like to talk to you in this film about three different ones. The first being the North American pitcher plant, otherwise known as the Ceracenia. The Ceracenia grows out of its boggy, waterlogged soil like a tall trumpet with a wide open mouth at the top. The Ceracenia plant is brightly and gaudily coloured often and it's that along with a sweet nectar that attracts its prey, usually insects. The insect lands on the plant and makes its way around the top edge, this open cavity here, taking the nectar as it goes. The thing is, it's a very slippy surface on there and more often than not the insect will lose its footing and fall into the tube below. Waiting for it at the bottom there is a mixture of rainwater and digestive juices and enzymes which only increase as the insect struggles at the bottom. Once an insect has fallen into a pitcher plant, a Ceracenia, it's very unlikely it's ever going to get out again. The sides of the plant on the inside are waxy and smooth and as the insect scrabbles at the surface its feet become clogged with that wax. In addition to that the Ceracenia has hundreds of tiny downward facing hairs that prevent the insect from crawling out again. Once the insect is fully digested over a period of days, it turns into a nutritious soup that the plant absorbs, enabling it to grow. In fact, just last week, I cut off one of the pitcher trumpets on one of my Ceracenia plants as it was starting to die back. And out of the bottom of that pitcher plant, poured that bug soup that the plant had made and it resembled something that looks like what you might produce from your nose 
when you have a cold. The next plant I'd like to talk to you about is perhaps the most famous carnivorous plant of them all, the Venus flytrap, which is the only carnivorous plant, in fact, it's the only plant that I'm aware of that knows how to count. Venus flytraps grow to around 13 centimetres across. Each plant usually has about six stems, which are fitted with hinged leaves at their ends. The edges of the leaves are lined with lashes, and when the leaf snaps shut, these form a trap. The most interesting thing about the Venus flytrap is how it eats. Flytraps lure their insects by the reddish pinkish lining in the leaves and by secreting a sweet smelling nectar. Once the bugs have landed on the jaws of the flytrap, it doesn't clamp down and close straight away. There are sensory hairs called trichomes on the inside of the leaves and when the insect lands on one, essentially the plant is starting to count. It's counting movements from the insect. There must be at least two movements from the bug in a 20 second window or the leaves won't close. The plant doesn't want to waste energy closing on anything that might not be a meal. Imagine if some leaf litter or other debris blew into the plant it wouldn't want to close because of that. And so it's waiting for the bug to move again. On that second movement, the plant closes its jaws in under a second by snapping shut. The lashes on the edge of the leaves work just like jail bars. They knit together to prevent the insect from escaping. But inside the leaf, the insect is wriggling. It's struggling to get free. And that's the third movement that the plant is waiting for so that it knows that it can start to introduce digestive juices to break down the bug. After five to 10 days, the plant will have finished eating and it will reopen and the parts of the bug that it couldn't eat will just fall out and the plant is ready to go again. So, as you can imagine, all of that opening and closing that's done by the Venus flytrap requires a tremendous amount of energy to be expended by the plant. And it gets that energy from the insects and other living creatures that it's capturing. So that's why it's really important that if you ever keep or ever see a Venus flytrap that you don't trigger the leaves falsely. Most leaves on a Venus flytrap are only capable of four or five closures in their entire lifetime. And so to trigger it falsely, to not provide it with any nutrient for a closure, would be the same as asking you to run a marathon without giving you any breakfast. As well as luring, capturing and digesting living things, the Saracenia and the Venus flytrap also share something else in common. And that is, they are both native to North America. And that means that they're temperate plants, that we can grow them outside all year round here in Great Britain, because we share a very similar climate. But the third carnivorous plant that I'd like to talk to you about comes from a very, very different environment altogether. And that is the Nepenthes. The Nepenthes carnivorous plant grows in tropical 
very humid climate and wouldn't do well outside here at all. As the Nepenthes grows in its humid rainforest home, it puts on these interesting pictures at the ends of its leaves. In the same way that a Saracenia secretes that sweet smelling, sweet tasting nectar, the Nepenthes does the same, luring in its prey, which soon loses its footing on this very slippery edge, dropping down into the picture below, which is half filled with rainwater, digestive juices and other enzymes. This picture then begins to act like a stomach. Once the insect is inside, there is very little chance of it escaping, and soon it begins to break down, all the nutrients that it contains being absorbed to help the plant continue to grow. But the Nepenthes has an interesting common name, and that is the monkey cup. And it earned this name because monkeys were observed in the wild breaking off these leaf ends, these pitchers, and drinking the contents inside. That mixture of rainwater and dead and dying and digesting bugs. Almost like some kind of icky bug smoothie. And so it got its name, the monkey cup or the monkey jar. But there is one other animal that in the wild has formed an even more intimate relationship with the Nepenthes than the monkeys have. Some species of Nepenthes grow so large they have been known to lure, capture and digest creatures as large as rats, and birds, lizards and frogs. But there's one little animal that has managed to form an alliance with the Nepenthes. That they have a symbiotic relationship that's of benefit to them both. And that is the mountain tree shrew. Let's imagine this glass of water is our Nepenthes pitcher in the wild. Along comes our tree shrew. He clambers up onto the top of the pitcher and quite apart from not falling in, he starts to lick the sugary sweet nectar from underneath the lid and from around the edge. The Nepenthes plant is providing our tree shrew with all of the carbohydrates that he needs. But what does the tree shrew give the Nepenthes in return? Well, he shuffles across the top of the lid and does a poo inside of the plant. He uses it just like a toilet. But the plant uses the nitrogen contained in the shrew's poo as food. So, the tree shrew benefits from the sugary nectar and the plant benefits from the nitrogen in the shrew's poo. Carnivorous plants don't invest in their root systems in the way that other plants do. After all, why would they? They're not looking to pull their nutrients out of the soil in the same way that other plants do. No, they get their nourishment from the things that they can lure, capture and digest. Whether that's creepy crawlies and bugs, rats, lizards, frogs, even the poo of rodents. And it's probably worth remembering that the next time you think about complaining about your school lunches. So, have fun, take care, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.